Hello children. I hope that you all are doing fine. I welcome you all to our special English hour. Here we learn lots of new things. And while learning these things, we also have fun. Are you ready for some fun? Let's get started. Children, as you all know, we always start our day with something fun and interesting. So today, I have a few fun facts for you. Today's fun facts are about mathematics. Some of you might like maths and some of you might not. But you will definitely find these fun facts interesting and entertaining. Are you ready? Let's have a look at the fun facts. Fun fact 1. In a room of 23 people, there is 50% chance that two people have the same birthday. Fun fact number 2. Most mathematical symbols weren't invented until the 16th century. Before that, equations were written in words. Fun fact number 3. 40 is the only number that is spelt with letters in alphabetical order. Fun fact number 4. 4 is the only number in English language that is spelt with the same number of letters as the number itself. And finally, fun fact number 5. 0 is not represented in Roman numbers. Children, we just saw some interesting fun facts about mathematics. But you must be wondering, why am I sharing fun facts about mathematics in an English class? Today, we will be reading a story. It is a biography of a man named Ramanujan. Do you know what a biography is? Biography is when someone writes about somebody else's life. So today, let's read a biography of a famous Indian mathematician named Ramanujan. Children, as you all know, it is very important that we learn new words. So today, let's learn some new words. You will see these words in the story when we read it. So I request you to please make a note of these words in your notebooks. Altered 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 I altered my dress as I could not fit into it. Baffling 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 The maths problem that Rima was solving was baffling. Enthusiasm 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 She was saving the enthusiasm for the final match. Insight 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 Your textbook I will be reading this story and I request you to point at the words as I read them. And if you don't have a textbook, listen to me carefully. One morning, early in 1913, Hardy found among the letters on his breakfast table a large untidy envelope 
decorated with Indian stamps. When he opened it, he found sheets of paper by no means clean, on which in a non-English script were line after line of symbols. Hardy glanced at them without enthusiasm. He felt more than anything bored. He glanced at the letter written in halting English, signed by an unknown Indian, asking him to give an opinion of these mathematical discoveries. The script appeared to consist of theorems, most of them wild or fantastic looking, one or two already well known, laid out as though they were original. There were no proofs of any kinds. Hardy was not only bored but also irritated. It seemed like a curious kind of fraud. He put the manuscript aside and went on with his day's routine. This story is set in the year 1913. Godfrey Hardy was an English mathematician, which means that he lived in England. One day, while he was having breakfast, he had a look at the letters that he had received. And he decided to open one such letter. This letter had Indian stamps on it, which meant that it had come from India. He opened the letter and he saw that there was a writing which was not in English. And below that, he saw certain equations. He realized that some of them were already been proven, while some of them looked fantastic. But he thought that these were not original ideas because it did not have any proof. The person who had sent this letter was asking Hardy for his opinions. Hardy was somewhat irritated because he thought that someone was stealing someone else's ideas. So he put the letter away and went on with his daily routine. After lunch, he loped off for a game of real tennis in the university court. If it had been summer, he would have walked down to Fenners to watch cricket. In the late afternoon, he strolled back to his rooms. That particular day, though, while the timetable wasn't altered, internally, things were not going according to plan. At the back of his mind, getting in the way, of his complete pleasure in the game, the Indian manuscript nagged away. Wild theorems. Theorems such as he had never seen before nor imagined. A fraud of genius? A question was forming itself with epigrammatic clarity. Is a fraud of genius more probable than an unknown mathematician of genius? Clearly, the answer was no. Back in his rooms in Trinity, he had another look at the script. He sent word to Littlewood, probably by messenger. Certainly not by telephone, for which, like all mechanical contrivances, including fountain pens, he had a deep distrust. 
that they must have a discussion after hall. Hardy went off to play table tennis. He had not made any changes in his daily plan. But something was not right. Nothing was going according to the way he had planned his day. At the back of his head, he was only thinking about the manuscript. He decided that he must speak to someone about it, which is why he sent a word to Little Wood, who was also an English mathematician. Before midnight, they knew, and they knew for certain. The writer of these manuscripts was a man of genius. That was as much as they could judge that night. It was only later that Hardy decided that Ramanujan was, in terms of natural mathematical genius, in the class of Gauss and Euler, but that he could not expect, because of the defects of his education and because he had come on the scene too late in the line of mathematical history to make contribution on the same scale. The following day, Hardy went into action. Ramanujan must be brought to England, Hardy decided. Money was not a major problem. Trinity had usually been good at supporting unorthodox talent. The college had been the same for Kapitsa a few years later. Once Hardy was determined, no human agency could have stopped Ramanujan. But they needed certain amount of help from a superhuman one. Before midnight, Little Wood and Hardy realized that Ramanujan was a genius. He thought that he was as good as Gauss and Euler, who were German and Swiss mathematicians respectively. Now, Ramanujan must have lagged behind because of his education and also because he entered the mathematical scene a bit late. But Hardy was determined to get Ramanujan to England. Ramanujan turned out to be a poor clerk in Madras, Chennai, living with his wife on 20 pounds a year. He was usually strict about his religious observances with a mother who was even stricter. It seemed impossible that he could break the ban and cross the water. Fortunately, his mother had the highest respect for the goddess of Namakkal. One morning, Ramanujan's mother made a startling announcement. She had a dream the previous night in which she saw her son seated in a big hall among a group of Europeans and the goddess of Namakkal had commanded her not to stand in the way of her son fulfilling his life's purpose. This, say Ramanujan's Indian biographers, was a very agreeable surprise to all concerned. Ramanujan was a clerk who lived in Madras, modern day Chennai. He lived with his wife and mother. Ramanujan and his mother were very religious, because of which it seemed that he could not cross the sea. Especially his mother was very strict about these things. 
but she was a great devotee of goddess Namikkal. And one day she had a dream and in that dream came goddess Namikkal. And she said that she sees a bright future for Ramanujan in Europe. Next day his mother got up and told Ramanujan about this dream. And that paved way for Ramanujan to travel to Europe. In 1914, Ramanujan arrived in England. So far as Hardy could detect, though in his respect, I should not trust his insight far, Ramanujan, despite the difficulties of breaking the caste laws, did not believe much in theological doctrine except for a vague pantheistic benevolence any more than Hardy did himself but he did certainly believe in ritual. When Trinity put him up in college within four years he became a fellow. There was no Alan St. Aubin self-indulgence for him at all. Hardy used to find him ritually changed into his pajamas, cooking vegetables rather miserably in a frying pan in his own room. Their association was strangely touching one. Hardy did not forget that he was in the presence of a genius. But genius that was, even in mathematics, almost untrained. Ramanujan had not been able to enter Madras, Chennai University because he could not matriculate in English. According to Hardy's report, he was always amiable and good-natured. But no doubt, he sometimes found Hardy's conversation outside mathematics more than a little baffling. He seems to have listened with a patient smile on his good, friendly, homely face. Even inside mathematics, they had to come to terms with the difference in their education. Ramanujan was self-taught. He knew nothing of the modern rigor. In a sense, he didn't know what a proof was. In an uncharacteristically sentimental moment, Hardy once wrote that if he had been better educated, he would have been less Ramanujan. Coming back to his ironic senses, Hardy later corrected himself and said that the statement was nonsense. If Ramanujan had been better educated, he would have been even more wonderful than he was. In fact, Hardy was obliged to teach him some formal mathematics as though Ramanujan had been a scholarship candidate at Winchester. Hardy said that this was the most singular experience of his life. What did modern mathematics look like to someone who had the deepest insight but who had literally never heard of most of it. Ramanujan was a genius and Hardy knew that he was in the presence of a genius. However, this genius was not formally trained in mathematics. Ramanujan could pass university because he could not complete his matriculation in English. There were many differences between Hardy and Ramanujan, but they had come to terms with it 
because they realized that both had a different background in education. It is good to remember that England gave Ram Anujan such honors as were possible. The Royal Society elected him a fellow at the age of 30, which even for a mathematician is very young. Trinity also elected him a fellow in the same year. He was the first Indian to be given either of these distinctions. He was amiably grateful, but he soon became ill. Hardy used to visit him as he lay dying in hospital at Putney. It was one of those visits that there happened the incident of the taxi cab number. Hardy had gone out to Putney by taxi as usual, his chosen method of conveyance. He went into the room where Ramanujan was lying. Hardy, always clumsy about introducing a conversation, said, probably without a greeting and certainly as his first remark, the number of my taxi cab was 1729. It seemed to me rather a dull number. To which Ramanujan replied, No, Hardy, it is a very interesting number. It is the smallest number expressible as the sum of the two cubes in two different ways. It was difficult in war time to move Ramanujan to a kinder climate. He died of tuberculosis back in Madras, Chennai, two years after the war. As Hardy wrote in the Apology, his roll call of mathematicians, Galois, died at 21. Abel, at 27, Ramanujan at 33, Riemann at 40. I do not know an instance of a major mathematical advance initiated by a man past 50. Children, I hope you had fun in today's session and most importantly, I hope that you learned something new. I will see you all in our next session. Until then, take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.